Hello, well, today is Thursday, May 2nd, 2024. This is the week in charts. So obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. If you're watching on YouTube and you want to sign up for future presentations, you can go to, you can go to DaveLiner.com, use your music site, slash webinar, or you could just sign up on YouTube. So what we talk about? Well, current market conditions, obviously, I have a lot to say about that. Your questions on trading, your favorite stock and crypto picks. Just hold on the picks until we get to the live charts. We'll do crypto first. I doubt we'll have much to talk about tonight in crypto, but there is a there's a couple things we'll take a look at for sure. I want to continue my series on what it means to be a trend following moron. We're on part five. And then I want to talk by by accident. I found a slide called market takeaways when the market's tanking. And I thought that might be pretty relevant for this presentation. As I said before, I've done presentations called Before the Bomb Blows Up at the peak of the market. I, I didn't know there was a peak at the time or whatever, but when the market's making all-time highs because nobody asks me about the market when everything's doing well, they wait until the market drops 30, 40%, and then they're freaking out and they ask me what to do. Anyway, speaking of market timing, we are nearing that caution zone once again. And one thing that I got to thinking about a little while ago is that you have time, but not unlimited time. And I want to bring up a few charts and show you what I mean about that. So what I'm saying is you have time to get out of a market. Everybody thinks a market just crashes, like uh, all of a sudden tonight it's going to crash and that's it, you know, but you usually have quite a bit of time to get out of the way. Not always a lot of time, but usually a lot of time. Anyway, there's all my contact info. Should you need to reach me, please follow me on YouTube and on Twitter. Subscribe on YouTube, I guess. All right, there's the flame screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. R is often summing up. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. That comes from Greg Morris. Now, when I was doing my nightly analysis tonight, and I see this quite often, especially when I'm doing my IPO analysis, but I noticed that one IPO, and this is kind of a reoccurring theme, and this is why I created these rules with IPOs. But we don't buy anything till at least day five. And the day one rule means that if the high is set on day one for a pattern like a buy at B, which buys on a new closing high on day the close of day five and beyond, like right before the close, it has to take out the day one high if that's the highest high of the week. Anyway, in this case, it was the highest high of the week, and it's the highest high so far. So this thing has lost about 75% of its value, if my math is correct on that, or at least two thirds of its value. And when you go through IPOs, it just this just happens over and over and over. You, you wouldn't believe how many come public and just absolutely tank. And if all you did was avoid them for the first five days and they come public on Monday and you wait until at least Friday's close before you decide to do anything, you're going to save yourself a lot of grief. Here's a slide I found a little while ago as I was putting my slides together. And these are some things you need to do when the market gets a little questionable. So you want to see each, each position to its fruition. We had one we put on last June or July, I think last June, and we're still in it. And we're up nicely in it so far, knock on wood. And... We had plenty of times where the market was beginning to look questionable since last June, obviously, but we stuck with the position. And I was recently answering somebody's comment on YouTube, and a, and a while back they said, well, I'm out of the market because I follow this guy, and whatever the market consolidates, he gets out of the way. And that's fine, but you're going to miss some big moves if every time the market gets a little questionable, you get out of the way. Now we're talking about individual positions right now versus an overall market timing. So as I've said quite a bit, the outlier is very important to the trend follower. We have to catch the occasional outlier to make it all worthwhile. And you never know what position will turn into that elusive outlier. Now if you quit early, even with good justification, you'll potentially miss out on those outliers, as Murphy would have it. I could all but guarantee that. Now, less is more, though, when the market begins a little questionable. And 
I don't remember exactly when I did this presentation. I think it was a, a presentation for stock charts back when I was doing my trading simplified show. So it's in one of those shows. But less is more. I went weeks without recommending new setups. And fortunately, the few the few worked well. Should you say worked well? Uh, the few, oh, I'm sorry. The few well chosen setups that I did recommend worked nicely. And I've been accused sometimes of being too selective. And I've actually taken that as a compliment for not like just chasing everything. Now, waiting for entries, I'm amazed at how much trouble can be avoided. Just recently, I recommended a stock and it just it just has it triggered day after day after day. And uh, the same day I recommended it, the next morning, somebody told me they were already long. It's like, oh, well, that's fine. But you didn't wait for an entry on that. And if you're in a market that's going straight up like 1999, then by all means, go ahead and front run the setups. But as a general statement, you really want to wait for those entries. And longs, for instance, right now in this crazy market, just that in and of itself could help, could keep you out of trouble. And I had one recently in my Landry list and I couldn't remember what it was. If somebody here that's in the Facebook group remembers, I dug around earlier today, I couldn't find it. But it was one that I, that I had in my list said it was a pretty good looking setup it wasn't recommended as official setup but it was a pretty decent looking setup that's why i had it in my landry list which i publish every night in my trading service and the next day it got whacked like 50 percent the good news is it never did trigger so if somebody was going to take that as an ancillary setup then it didn't even get past the prior day's high so you can't even argue that wiggle room would have would have saved you just waiting for it to take out the prior day's high in and of itself would have saved you in this particular situation. Now, make sure you have the ability to short. And what I was thinking about as I was going live tonight is you don't necessarily need to set up a margin and short account. You could buy puts. Now, that's a tricky business, and I know it could be kind of crazy. And if you're going to use puts as a substitution for stock, I think in my first book, I talked about doing that. And I ran it by a, a hedge fund manager who sells options or used to sell options and run, he used to run a, uh, an options head fund and uh, he said it was fine. So uh, that's my way of saying it. I'm not an options expert, but you can use deep in the money options as a substitution for puts. And uh, I think it's www.davelandry slash free book and you get a copy of that book. That's the first book. Now, Tread lightly on the short side, as I preach, hey, John, you're not going to get rich likely on the short side, but you can sometimes make a little money. And the other thing it will do, as I preach, it'll help you see both sides of the market. I know I've said this ad nauseum, but my friends who run a lot of money and based on their charters, they can't short or they just they just didn't work that into their fund. They tend to always be a little glass half half empty when it comes to the overall market. So that's just kind of a, a general statement. I'm not singling out anyone in particular, but they it, it, I get it because they, they can only go long. But make sure you you tread lightly and be selective and probably your best shorts, especially when the market is kind of topping out like it is now, if it's topping out. We're at a bit of an inflection point. We'll We'll look at that in just a second. But your best shorts are going to be those stocks that are that are just beginning to roll over from these high levels, as opposed to stocks that are already in established downtrends. Now, God forbid we get into a prolonged bear market, then those will be all the stocks that are left, and you'll you'll have to go with those. I like to, as a general statement, I like to try to match the pattern to the market. All right. I want to do a, a brief update on the TFM 10% system, and we're approaching the caution zone once again. Jeff, who's here tonight, and I'm, I thank him very much for doing this, he pointed out that once you get 5% or more away from the 50-week closing high like we did right here, the market could be in trouble. And the TFM system is 10% or more, which is this red zone or hot pink, whatever you call that and a close below the 50-week simple moving average. So this was a whipsaw signal. This was a sell signal. The buy signal would have been right here in the green zone. And you need two days, two lows greater than 50 simple moving average. 
It doesn't have to be in the green zone. You just have to be within 10% of the 50-week closing high. So you could actually still be in the pink zone and have a buy signal. But anyway, as Jeff pointed out, once you get into that, that uh, pinkish zone, the market often gets in trouble. And somebody on Twitter pointed out, once you get past the 10% and you get a sell signal, there, there's a 60% chance. Back here was a sell signal, and this is 10% or more away from the 50-week closing high. And I plotted them as zones, and I should be able to share this if you have uh, Stock Charts ACP. I could share this with you uh, just by hitting this little button down here. But anyway, as Jeff pointed out, when you get 5% or more, that's where you, it, a bit of a caution zone, so to speak. And one thing that, that I noodled with a little bit was what would happen if you kind of sorted a countdown and if you didn't get back in green within so many weeks, okay, then you would think about exiting. And it, it, it seems like it has some promise to it. So it's just something maybe, maybe a little fodder for for research. But anyway, so once you get past this green zone, that's where you need to be a little bit concerned. You can see two weeks ago, we did close in that caution zone. And it's a little hard to read, but that's 4991. That's why I wrote that in there so you can read it. So if we close below 4991, that would be definitely be a caution tomorrow. And let's hope, I know you shouldn't say hope, but let's hope that doesn't happen. NASDAQ Composite two weeks ago also closed in that caution zone. So again, don't worry. Within 5% of the 50-week closing high, you can see the parameters are over here. So this green zone is the percent of close with, let's see, no, here it is, 95% of the close, and then this is 90% of the close. Oh yeah, that's 100% of close. Okay, so 100% would be the top of the green zone 95 would be the bottom of the green zone and then 90 would be down here so 10 percent away from the 50-week closing high anyway so if we close below 15,607 on the nasdaq we would be in that pink zone on friday so that would be something to be concerned about and your sell signal for the tfm 10 percent system will be at 14,004, it's hard for me to read, <laughs> four something, 404, I think, 14,404. And that's gonna change a little bit once we add in today's closing price. All right, so that's the, the zones. Let's pay attention tomorrow. Tomorrow is May 3rd. Let's see if we close in that caution zone. If we do, doesn't mean you want to run out and sell the form, but you might want to have it appraised, okay? And it doesn't mean you want to get out of your longs. And that's the point I was just trying to make. Hang on to your positions, see each position to its fruition, because you never know which one will define gravity. Maybe for some reason, some stock, we were long a pot stock, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. You know, maybe pot stocks will defy gravity and continue to go higher, although we did get shaken out. And I use a little discretion to stay with it. We'll talk about that next week and i'll let you know how that shakes out good or bad anyway getting back to the market timing you have you have time okay and again everyone thinks that a market just crashes like bam that's it the market crashed well the more you don't realize it you being like the, the general public not you people <laughs> who know a little bit about trading here in cases a lot more than me uh you have time okay you, you just don't have unlimited time so if we go back and look at the bear market the 2008 bear market so in 2007 the market made all-time highs and then it took 13 weeks to get a tfm 10 percent system sell signal so remember that this is a weekly chart for this particular system okay now, the other thing of interest is notice that we went sideways for a long, long time, and we didn't make much forward progress for almost a half of a year, and that's before the market began to sell off a little bit. So that's something to remember. Just saying he's been playing with 5% and 30 
MA versus 10% and 50 MA, it looks promising. Yeah, I did some research. I didn't go with a, with a, with a, a shorter term moving average, but that's a good idea. Uh, again, I'm getting good stuff here from Jeff. I think you're going to get more whipsaw, but you're also get going to get out of the way sooner. When you when you design a system, you have to have some sort of goal in mind. And if you're going to trade somebody else's system, you have to understand their designer's intent. So this system, the TFM 10% system, was designed to help you avoid the diaper change moments, to help get you out of the market, to help get you out of the way. Now, it just so happens that the buy signals work okay, especially if you're in a prolonged type of choppy downtrend. But the original goal or the designer's intent of the system was to get you out of the way before a bear market happens. Now, there's no guarantees. The system's been out there, I don't know how long, maybe five years or so, maybe longer. Um, I need to think about it. I need to time it uh, in terms of when I moved here, I think, you know, it's like I told my wife, it's like I didn't realize I've been here like four or five years already. I thought I just moved here like last year or the year before, you know, it's crazy how fast time passes. But anyway, this thing's been public for quite a while. And so far, it's held up fairly well. But just looking at it historically, with, of course, you have some hindsight, obviously, you would have avoided every bear market in history. When I designed it, I didn't go all the way back and look at 1928, 29, and the 50s and the 70s, all that. I just looked at more recent bear markets, came up with this premise and said, okay, well, let's go back and see what happened way back in time. And that way I know I haven't done any, any curve fitting going way back in time. And that's kind of the way you want to kind of look at a system. All right, lots of good information coming in. So yeah, Jeff, um, so you're going to exit at 5% versus 10% and below the 30 weekly moving average that's that's interesting that that might because that that 50 this 50 here it looks like it's catching up quickly but this thing takes a long long time to catch up and the reason i use the moving average is kind of a whipsaw filter to keep you from getting in and out in and out in and out now i don't have any good examples to show you here but imagine that this was the 10% line and you drop, you keep dipping below it, in and out, in and out, in and out. I required the moving average to, to slow it down a little bit. Seems like not much better getting out, but much better getting back in, need more research. I agree with you. Okay, so what Jeff's saying is, if you get in a pro prolonged bear market like this, this was 2002. And I remember the 2002, 2003 bottom like took forever to happen. Well, notice all these zones are coming down and notice this moving average is coming down so it catches up nicely. So Jeff's point is, it's gonna be quicker to get you out and it's gonna be quicker to get you back in. Now I have other ways of getting back into the market other than this just one system like bow ties and Landry Light and stuff like that. But his point is, it'll help the system catch up to the market, I agree. I agree with that. Okay. So this is, uh, again, this is 2002, okay? We made all-time highs back here, actually 2000. And it was three weeks, and we did have a sell signal after three weeks. Now, you could argue, well, Dave, that's a whipsaw filter and a whipsaw signal, meaning that it got you out and then it got you back in. You are correct. But what's interesting is... This was kind of like a shot across the bow, like, well, hang on a second. And notice that we never did make a new high, even though you, you had a signal to get back in. And then your second signal was 29 weeks later. So that's six months later, you get the second signal, okay? So that's a long time. And, and it, again, when you're in a bear market, it feels like it just happens overnight. It doesn't happen overnight, believe it or not. And here's what's kind of a shocking thing, and it's hard to wrap your head around. I learned it from Greg Morris. And, you know, Greg tells you something, it's usually pretty good, and you'd better listen. <laughs> but he said that bear market, or, or, or tops, I should say, the way a bear market starts, is usually more of a process than an event. And, it, and it's hard to wrap your head around that. And the bear market bottoms, 
or usually more of an event than a process. You get like a spike down and then that's it and the market comes straight back up. All right, Brian says, yesterday's high volume update spike was more than 300 points round trip on a QQQ. Historically, isn't that a precursor to a significant pullback? So I don't know what you're saying, but you're saying that volume, high volume up down spike you're saying the fact that it went up and it came right back down. Yeah, I mean, you know, I like the way you think because that likely sucked in a bunch of people thinking it's the all clear, like, oh, Fed's not going to do anything with rates or whatever. And then maybe it's the all clear. And then all of a sudden it, it sucks them in and spits them out. So I don't know. But that's definitely something that you might want to take a look at. I would maybe look into volatility while you're doing that. I'm not sure if the historical volatility would completely reflect that intraday volatility. So maybe start looking at what happens. And this is good. This is fodder for research. I like the way you think. So I mean, take a look at, for instance, this, this wide range bar down here. So maybe when you start getting these wide range adverse bars, you might need to think about uh, getting out of the market or you might need to think that the market could be in trouble. So yeah, that's probably something there so brian says yes market makers are hunting for liquidity interesting i like the way you think so anyway once again you can see this market with sideways for a long 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 time these are months and months and months and months and months and even though it it, it tested the top of that range notice that it it never did get past that it came back in once it made that all-time high and by the way, just as a general statement, and I think some of this comes from Greg too, and it's helped along by Je uh, Jeff's analysis, is that as long as the market is fairly close to its old highs, you don't have a lot to worry about, okay? It's a, it, there's always something to worry about, but in general, as long as you're close to the old highs, the market's in pretty good shape. And I was testing some things like just stay long when the market's green. And, and just randomly, this is 1987. Uh, but looking at this chart, this, I mean, I knew I knew this slide was coming up, but I didn't know you had such great trends. But notice that in the green zone, this market did really, really well. In the red zone, the pink zone or whatever, it starts to kind of meander. Then you're back in the green zone. And then, of course, you're back in the pink zone up here. And then the market crashed. Now, this crash did feel like it was overnight. I guess in one case it was. But notice that it made new highs and it took eight weeks before you had a sell signal to TFM system. And then we had the crash on the following Monday. So this happened fairly quickly, but it was at least eight or nine weeks before the market actually crashed from the high. And if you're working off a daily chart, as I'll show you a couple in a minute here, then you can see that you do have time, especially if you're more of a trader type paying attention to what's going on. Now we had all time highs going into the pandemic. And then in this case, it was only two weeks before we had the sell signal for the TFM 10% system. And then you're like, okay, well that's not enough time. Well, you did have a, a third week before the market began to sell off in general. Now, if you take a look at the bow ties, what's kind of cool is that TFM 10% system, which is the weekly system, actually triggered right before the bow tie triggered. So a longer term system triggered first. And that was kind of shocking for me because I didn't think it would, be, would react that quickly. But when you have a percentage, kind of a line in the sand, and then that moving average, and it gets cut through quickly, then you get a, a fairly robust type of quick signal. And I thought that was pretty cool. I know I'm a nerd. All right, so we made all-time highs coming into the pandemic. Then we had a bow tie to the downside. And that proper order began on that slide. And then you can see the market retrace, and then the bow tie sell signal would have been right there, which was, was, uh, which was actually a little bit longer than, uh, took a little bit longer to trigger than the TFM 10% system, which is kind of cool. but. As a general statement, your daily signals will give you more of a heads up. So if you go back to the pandemic once again, 
We made all-time highs, and then we had lots and lots and lots of Landry light before the market really began to tank. So you did have some warning. You did know that the market was in trouble. And when you're seeing a breakdown like this, especially if you're getting a weekly signal, right? Yeah, there's always a chance of a whipsaw, but the old hedge fund adage comes to mind, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. Now, I'm not saying dump all your longs. Again, you want to see each position to its fruition, but when the market begins to crack in, in earnest, I'm trying to think of a line from Pulp Fiction, you know, <laughs> that's going to be one charming pig, for a stock to defy gravity and not stop out, you might actually have one charming pig or whatever they called it. What's the total breadth measurement of TFM like for all the const constituents of the S&P 500, for example? I don't know. I, I, I don't really study breadth. And, I, you know, years ago, I think I gave it away. And somebody here tonight probably has it. I, when I moved into my new house, I had, I had boxes to the ceiling almost of books. And I had no place to put them because I had a, uh, a thousand square foot office at my old place. And I don't even know what the square footage is. I'm embarrassed to even measure this one. <laughs> um, we, we're in a shotgun now. We downsized like from six and a third acres down to a, a postage stamp lot. We still have like yard guard though, but that's that's another story. Uh, it's a little embarrassing. Um, we didn't have a yard guy for all six acres, believe me. But anyway, um, I downsized and I sold all my I sold all my books. I gave them all the way to my clients. And uh, it was the, the Encyclopedia of Stock Market Technical Indicators or something like that. And uh, I can get the name for you, but I um, I gave the book away. I, I tried everything in the world. And so I didn't get into breadth numbers and all that other good stuff. But maybe there's some merit in some of that. I just like keeping it simple and, and be a, a price purist as much as possible. So, yeah, Nick, I'd be interested in hearing what your thoughts are on that if you have. Uh, if you want to do some research on that, and I'm not full, I don't fully understand what you're saying. Like, are you looking at the TFM system with the individual stocks? And the only problem with doing that is you're going to have something like um, the video, which I'm guessing is in the S&P 500. It's going to have an HV of, I'm just pulling a number out the air, probably 80. And the PE is going to have an HV of about 15. So that type of system is not going to work. But when you smash them all together, you get a more efficient market like the S&P 500 and 10% becomes a significant move and works out pretty good for the NASDAQ too. As I've said quite a bit, I took a trade uh, with the Qs. Okay, yeah, yeah, we'll get to that, John, when we get to the uh, the charts. Also, you long ghost in the machine. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't had uh, much ghost in a while. I'm not a hop head too much. I almost bought some Anve the other night, which is Ghost in the Machine Light. I do like that that uh, juicy wheat that they make. That's uh, What brewer is that? I should know this. I mean, that wife, one of my brewer friends is watching. He's going to be embarrassed. Is it Gnarly Barley or it's, uh, I think it's the one, we'll figure it out. But Ghost in the Machine, really good. Hey, if you're liking this video, like it. If you're, if you're watching it on YouTube. And if you don't like it, go have no fun somewhere else. <laughs> Oh, getting aside, uh, please like it and then uh, subscribe. That helps the algorithm and it helps me to give uh, put out more and more free content. I love your videos. Old school trader from the 90s getting back in the game and you are so refreshing. I consider myself a TFM. Well, thank you, Paul. I appreciate that. Glad to have you back. Yeah, you guys, guys like you, I love you guys because you get it. You're not looking for the get rich quick thing. I, I got an email yesterday and it said that if, I, I don't know how much money I had to give them, but it said that they would return 85% a day. I did the math on that. I figured let's just do a thousand bucks, you know? And at the end of 30 days, it would be worth a hundred and something billion dollars. So it's like, uh, they're really setting it on fire there. <laughs> Which you know is bullshit. I mean, come on. If you can make a billion dollars in less than a month, you know, I mean, if I could, you'd never see my fat ass again, right? Instead, I'm grinding it out. And I love you guys. So, all right, lately I've been doing a series on what it means to be a trend following moron. 
and we're on port five. I'll probably need to go ahead and wrap this up because a lot of the stuff is the same exact stuff that I preach. And I guess being a Trend Valley moron, that makes sense. But as some of these examples come up, I want to kind of bring them to your attention. And one of them, and this is one I think I've mentioned already, is that the TFM doesn't seek themes. He lets themes find him. And, and as, as a, for instance, when Academy IPO, and I didn't, I didn't take the buy at B signal, but I took the first setup there because I felt like as a trend following moron, I had to. And I thought it was a stupid idea because how can a brick and mortar retailer make it in this day and age? Well, it turns out everybody wanted kayaks and stuff like that to go get out of the house. Okay. Because <laughs> everybody was cooped up and that worked out. It was a coal company years ago, one of our biggest winners went up like 600%, stopped out, I think three or 400%. But at one point it was up five or six hundred percent and i had no idea and, and i don't know what the theme turned out to be maybe it was the and i'm not being political but maybe it was that the the demand for the electricity to power the electric cars but they needed to burn more coal i don't know <laughs> don't want to get caught in those conversations anyway you can see this uh this stock bottomed out nothing to do there this is a pot stock uh, canopy growth and then it really began to take off and it caught my eye when it pulled back. And then also other pot stocks were taking off and pulling back. And I wasn't like, ooh, pot stock. So pot's going to do this or pot's going to do that. But I was like, you know, it's a setup. So I took it and we had a 78% move just the other day. Now, this is straight from the trading service. And I didn't know it was going to go up 78%, but I just followed along like a TFM. Entry was here, stop was down there, and the IPT was here. Unfortunately, it's hit, it's it's come right back in and hit the mechanical stop. I did use a little discretion and stick with it, and I'll show you what I did and some of the reasoning behind what I did next week. And we'll see how it works. When you use a little discretion, you're not throwing caution to the wind, but you might give a position a little bit more wiggle room. So in this particular case, even if I stopped out at a little bit lower level, I'd still be at a profit in the second loaf of those shares, okay? <laughs> prior to teaching the TFM, prior to learning the TFM, I was just the M. Yeah, well, you know what? Sometimes we um, we all feel like the M, just the M. I felt like a genius on Tuesday and I got my ass handed to me yesterday, so. <laughs> I'll get to that in one second. Now, the TFM lets the market make decisions for him. So just because I had the chart ready to go, you can put in a stop entry order. Like sometimes I'll put in a stop order to enter a stock and I'll forget that I put it in, well, entered it. And then I'll go to lunch or whatever, come back from lunch. I'm like, oh, I'm long this stock. I didn't realize it even triggered. So you can let that mark, let the market make your decisions for you because the more decisions you have to make especially the heat of battle the tougher it's going to be now i don't always use hard stops but you could put a hard stop in too and that's especially if i need to trade out of something i don't just wait for the thing to bounce and get out of it i say okay it looks like it's kind of bottoming out a little bit but i put my uncle point in okay just like and i don't know how it didn't get hit but like two days ago the CGC, my stop was at 20 cents, 1020, and it went to 1021. And I could could have very easily, you know, noise alone, obviously, or a little bit more noise could have taken me out. But I did have, I did eventually put a hard stop in because I didn't want to. The, the problem is, let's say you got it. Say, okay, I'm gonna get it at 1020. It goes to 1015. Okay, well, maybe I would just give it to 1010. And before you know it, all of a sudden it blows through that, and, and then you're going further and further down now i'll show you the example of, of how that can happen in just one second so it's a very dangerous thing to do but if you put that hard stop in the great thing is the market will make that decision for you now the ipt was here and you could put in a limit order okay and i actually and unfortunately i preach using these uh automated trailing stops when you're trying to exit half but i was a little skittish and maybe I was influenced by the fact that this position was kind of all over the place, even though it looks like it just went straight up, but it was kind of all over the place to get there. 
So I just put in a limit order and I got my IPT out at the limit. But if a stock is running, you might put an automated trailing stop and intraday, it'll automatically trail that stop up for you. Those things can be wonderful. You got to be careful with them, obviously, like everything else, because you can get a spike and then get stopped out. But if you're trying to squeeze out some extra profits, let's say in this case, we're looking for 1130 and all of a sudden it's at 12. Well, you might put in a half a point or even a point, depending on how far it goes, trailing stop. And then at the end of the day, you get out half of your shares if you're not stopped out. And sometimes you can squeeze out an extra couple of points in a, in a stock, especially something that's running up 78% in one day. Now, this doesn't always happen, obviously. I wish it did. <laughs> um, but it can, okay? It can occasionally happen. And, and you never know. The trend following moron never knows which stock is going to be the next big winner. I, I'm i hesitant to say which one it is, but recently I picked the stock and I said, this thing's a winner. I am 100% convinced it will be a winner. And it's been choppy, choppy, choppy. And finally today, it's like back in the black again. I'm like, okay, you know, you're not going to disappoint. But I don't always have that strong feeling when I'm looking at something. I'm like, okay, it looks good. Let's just see what happens. And sometimes to my surprise, one will take off that I wasn't maybe quite as sure about as another, but all the all the pieces sort of fit. So hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, CGC was a bottle rocket. A bottle rocket is when you have a, a stock that just goes straight up and then comes right back down. And that can be a bit of a bummer. It's okay if you're long, but unfortunately, you start counting your chickens like, oh, tomorrow I'm going to be up another 78%. <laughs> Counting the chickens, I'm I, I've got three. <laughs> My wife wanted chickens, so we got chickens. We had chickens in the country. They're a lot of fun, they really are. But uh, we got a lot of trees in the backyard, a lot of hawks smelling those chickens. So every day, all day long, I'm counting my chickens, literally. Now, one thing I want to make sure I mention is that the TFM doesn't trade when the risks are seemingly small. Trade not to lose. And and I actually, truth be told, occasionally might be guilty of such behavior on intraday trades and like try to catch these intraday reversals, which is bad behavior. And I realize that. And this is why I, I I'm confessing publicly. And I, I actually put in my trading journal TNTL, trading not to lose. But as a general statement, or not a general statement, as a rule, you don't want to trade not to lose you want to trade when you think the odds are potentially great you want to get in a stock that's a little bit more volatile within reason that has nice orderly pattern nice clean pullback and you think that stock has a potential to double or triple or more from where you get in that's what you want to do you don't want to get in like well i'm just going to risk a little bit and see what happens okay that's a that's a bad thing to do Guilty often of doing that. I never say never, but I don't think I'd ever do that on a daily chart. So you only want to trade when the, when the opportunities are potentially great. As uh, those of you who know me, we call that the F yeah trade. If you're looking at a market, you're not feeling F yeah, then pass. It's like all day long today. I was just kind of, eh, the market's all chopping around and all. I just could, could get into it. And I found myself getting sucked into couple of small trades and they didn't work out it's like you know dave trust your gut trust your instinct or just look at the charts and see that everything's chopping around especially the day after a crazy fed day let this thing settle out a little bit for the intraday stuff at least with the position stuff it's a little bit more cut and dry as to what you should do follow along anyway you want to make sure you're trading when opportunities are great you don't come in and say, well, look at this stock. It's pretty low. It's the lowest it's been in months, years, whatever. I'm just going to buy it. I'm going to put a stop right below the low. What's the worst could happen? Well, you think you're only risking this much, but all of a sudden, let's say that stop got hit like right there. You're like, well, let me just see what happens. And then all of a sudden, you get a day like that, like that where it begins to implode in earnest. And then maybe you get this one little bounce day. Well, maybe I'll hang on. Before you know it, you're in a lot more trouble than you thought you would be, okay? Now, if a market is breaking out intraday or something and you wanna 
go in and take a stab and put a tight stop in right below that breakout. That's a little bit different story. That's not exactly trading not to lose. But if you're watching an ETF bang out new lows and just because it's low, you think you want to pile in for a day trade, that's a bad idea. Now, this is one that we could go on and on and on for weeks. And this is why I'm probably going to have to wrap up the series this week and work on something else because as you know we've <laughs> brian i've never done that yeah right <laughs> you know i always i'm always uh i'm good friends with one of you guys who are, it, it, i'll just say uh i'll say stuff that it is like said no trade or ever <laughs> we're all guilty of these behaviors it's just we need you to learn from them and make sure we don't do them again i think uh livermore said that the guy who never made a mistake would own the world in a month and the guy who never learned from his mistakes would never own a blessed thing. But yeah, I made a lot of mistakes. I made a lot of mistakes yesterday. I did some stupid stuff. And, and you know, we're never immune. And that's why you have to be constantly be on guard. And by the way, one thing that I thought was 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 interesting, I think I learned it from Scott Adams' book, but I seem to have learned it on my own too, is that discipline gets used up. Okay. And so I sat here all day long and finally around two o'clock my time, an hour before the close, I just felt like I had to do something. I just can't just sit here all day. Yes, you can, you know? And the, the the position trading, I can go weeks and sometimes months without a new position without a problem because I've done that for years and years and years and that's what I do. But this intraday stuff, if I'm sitting there looking at a screen, if I'm not careful, I'm gonna feed that slot machine as Dakota calls. It's like having a slot machine on your desk, right? But anyway, the, the battle is, is definitely within, and that's kind of a, a Jesse Livermore quote, too. Um, was it Pogo? We met the enemy, and he is us. Extraneous influences, this is a, a, a big psychological thing when it comes to trading, and I don't see a lot of other people talk about this, and this is why I beat the dead horse so much. When you go to make that trade, you're not just making that trade in a vacuum. You've got a lot of baggage that comes with it, okay? You could have a, a fight with your spouse or your significant other or both. If you have a fight with both, you probably shouldn't be trading. If you have both, you might not be, <laughs> be trading. Uh, needing money, having money, okay? I had one of my biggest days ever, or one of the biggest days ever, I think, on Tuesday. And on Wednesday, I had one of my worst days. So it's like, and that's because... I had all this money. I'm Dave Landry, okay? And I was a little full of myself and I got my ass handed to me like I should have, okay? It's like, it's like Joe Pesci, my cousin Vinny, I could use a good ass weapon. Well, I needed one and I got one. Uh, needing money. We all need money. It's like everything's so friggin' expensive now. It's 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 uh, scary if you think about the, the just the money that's going out and you're trying to replace that money that's going out. You could have a recent string of losses that makes you scared to take the next trade, even though it's the most beautiful trade you've seen, even though it's a, like an F, yeah, set up. Uh, a big update, that's that's guilty this week. Uh, as I said, I used to, and I say this every week, I know it, but it's just to show you how the battles within and these extraneous things could really mess you up. I couldn't figure out why I was losing money every time I walk in the office and make trades. And before you know it, I'd be I'd, I'd be down and, and stopping out on the intraday stuff at least. And then it, I realized that, wait a minute, I was a little sugar low when I left the office and everything looked like shit. And when I came back feeling good with a, with a full belly, it's like everything looked great. And that's the uh, hangry judge effect. <laughs> it's like, you know, I didn't, I stopped trading when I walked in the office. It's just like, if, by the way, if you don't know why you're doing something, write it down, write it down, write it down. Jeez, I seem to make stupid trades every time I walk in the office. So I'm going to at least have a little pause next time I walk in the office before I make any stupid trades. And I'm going to write WITO, walk in the office in my trading journal. And that's going to give me a little bit of a pause. And from a neurological standpoint, you don't need a whole lot of pause to stop from doing impulsive things, okay? Anyway, so the whys, W-Y-W-H-Y-S, may be revealed at a later date. You just have to stop the bleeding if there's something that's going wrong. 
And then later on, you'll become W-I-S-E to the Y's. Like, why am I doing that? Oh, now I know because I just had breakfast or I just had lunch or I just had a snack and now I'm feeling good. So it has nothing to do with the market. And separating extraneous is tough, but it's like right before you click into that trade, you need to think what's going on in my head? What's happening? The, the other thing you need to do is you need to write three handwritten pages every day when you first wake up. I've told everybody this. I don't think anybody does it. If anybody here does it tonight, let me know. I'll be impressed. It's one of the hardest things you'll ever do, but it goes actually pretty quickly now. And, and believe it or not, as I've said a thousand times, I actually look forward to waking up and writing. And it's actually one of the things that gets me out of bed. Now, just, and I say in more recent times, it was about 12 years ago where uh, Denise Scholl was speaking before me and she talked a lot about neurology and trading and I never thought about the neurology. And since then I read several books on neurology and specifically neurology and trading. If you go to davelearn.com slash books dash two dash read, you can get a list of those. But one thing that, that I found interesting and this was outside of trading, I learned this from a neurological standpoint. And this is what creates gambles ruin, by the way. And uh, losses suck, they really suck. And I, and I don't, I know you don't need me to tell you that, but what's interesting is it's two times. And some people say, one of you guys, I forget which one, um, might, have been, might be you, John, said that it's like more like 10 times, but I know it's a lot more from an emotional impact standpoint. So let's just go with two. So when you have a losing trade, it's twice the emotional impact as a winning trade. Now I'll tell you something else from my learnings in psychology or readings in psychology and, and, and neurology and all. It's like an observation or talking about something will stress you out. Like my wife, will, oh, it's going to cost $2,000 to get a car repair. It's like, okay, well, just get it, get it done. You know, it's like, okay, $2,000. Okay, I live with that, whatever. And then later on that night, oh, it's going to be two thousand dollars. It's like, oh, so I got to keep reliving that over and over again. When I have a losing trade, I keep looking at it all day long, and every observation becomes a double whammy or twice is hard or twice the emotional. I mean, they've measured this, so it's true from a neurological standpoint. You can't escape this, but every time you you look at a stupid losing trade especially if you're supposed to be out of that trade, right? It just creates more and more animosity inside your head. So, you know, let's just say you're you're batting, what's that, 500 would be 50%? So 50% win rate, if you're position trading, is actually pretty good. I know it sounds kind of crazy, but it's pretty good. But let's say... You're doing that, and so plus one on a winning trade, minus two on a losing trade, and maybe even more if you're watching it until it stops out. Then plus one and minus two, you add all that up, and it's it's a it's a net negative. And and that's part of the gambler gambler's ruin is once you start once you start going down, they start chasing that high, and that high is really hard to get. They get a little winning hit, okay, there it is, you know, and then and then they get bam, they get slammed down again. So it's a really it's really a dangerous thing if you think about it, and it does apply to trading. Okay, lots of questions. Okay, we'll get to the stock picks. Book the gain when there's a Livermore earthquake event. I was long a bunch of these and taking heat. Sandal, SNDL, ACB, Curl F. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, that's uh, Linda Rasky says, uh, feed the ducks while they're quacking. So, but you, you do want to, I hear you, uh, John, but you do want to also make sure you're keeping a piece in case in case it keeps on keeping on. Um, and I, I'm going to use the word hope, but, you know, I was hoping that there would be this big squeeze in CGC and that thing would run for days and days and days, maybe halts and all kind of other crazy, crazy stuff happening. Obviously, it didn't happen. But, yeah, you know, it's OK. And, and you know, you get a 78 percent windfall. It's probably okay to peel off a few more shares. I try to follow everything 
as close to the trading service as possible with a little discretion, obviously, like I stayed with a CGC so far, knock on wood, um, and had stopped out my new stop. But you do want to try to, it's okay to maybe peel off a few more shares when, when it gets totally crazy like that. Like Linda Rasky says, feed the ducks while they're quacking. Okay, we're going to hop into crypto. Any questions, anything thus far? Let me see what's happening on YouTube. Uh, Nick, if you could flesh out my total breath, uh, that would be, that'd be interesting. Maybe I could learn something here. Okay, so I'm going to jump over to crypto real quick. And uh, again, if there's any questions, let me know. And if there's any individual stocks that uh, you guys want to start talking about or any crypto pairs, let me know. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on crypto tonight just because the crypto market is not so hot. Let's take a look at Bitcoin and Ethereum, obviously. So Bitcoin is beginning to get, or beginning to have, I should say, in case my wife's watching, correct my English, a lot of Landry light to the downside. So that's the 30 EMA. In fact, let me do this real quick. We'll get this, while this is getting booted up, we'll take a look at the Landry light with Bitcoin on that too. So... I'll show you what I mean. It's easier to see with uh, this platform. So down here is the Landry light. And that's just simply highs less than the moving average or lows greater than the moving average. And if they intersect the moving average, then there's no Landry light. But you can see we're starting to get downside Landry light. We've got eight days here. Or we have eight days here, I should say. Again, in case the wife is watching. <laughs> now, she's done a good job of correcting my, my poor coon ass English. Jeez. <laughs> uh, now, it's, what's interesting is we are in Botrin proper order, also in Bitcoin. As a general statement, I wouldn't trade mechanically, but as a general statement, green good, okay, when you're in Botrin bow tie proper order. Red is bad and yellow, of course, is caution. Anyway, so uh, what's his name? Peter Schiff might eventually be right. Um, he's been poo-pooing Bitcoin for uh, ever since they invented this thing. <laughs> they invented this Bitcoin out of thin air. It's kind of like kind of like the US dollar, all these fiat currencies. They're just made up. There's the nothing behind them. <laughs> Ethereum has been lagging Bitcoin for the most part. It has improved a little bit as of late, but in general, it tends to lag Bitcoin for whatever reason, I do not know. Let's take a look at the strongest pairs real quick. As I've said ad nauseum, sometimes when these things are running, you can just buy the ones that are going straight up. I wouldn't buy this one down at these low levels because it's kind of bottom fishing, but if you seeing that are making some decent new hot like that right there I, I almost bought this one earlier today based on the tails in here it looks a little thin and i'd prefer to see more uh running okay but you know what that looks pretty good i've got a bad habit of <laughs> trading doing webinars uh just for s and g's let's let's take a uh i'm gonna go ahead and take a small position there now ideally you want to see bitcoin making some new highs and then you want to see um a bunch of other ones running because so this is more of a chance this is a little bit more of a flyer type of trade but this is kind of the idea and it'd be good to do a live example so we could we could talk about it next week oh it's can't find it oh i wonder why oh here it is all right let's go to the market and let's do this Let's do cash. Okay, I am long ABT and I'm long from uh, $3, okay? So my initial profit target on these things, I've just been using 
20%, okay? So my entry is there. What's uh 20%, 360? How's that for quick math, huh? Three times 1.2, 360. Very good, Dave. So I'm gonna put in a limit order at 360, 3.60. And I'm gonna sell half at that level. Bam, so the limit order's in place. And so I'm gonna go ahead and put a line here at 360 so I know that. So I know that I have an order in place. So again, I'm just looking to get these crazy ones like this. I'm looking to get 20% off. And then I'm gonna take half of those profits. And then, as I've been saying, I might do a little mining, take a small piece and put into uh, Bitcoin just for S and Gs. So that's the general idea. I just want to make that trade to show you. Sometimes you just buy these things that are making new highs as they're making new highs. Let me just put a little note next to this one. Let me know I'm long. It's been so long since I bought one. It's been a couple of weeks. I forget which I'm using for that. I think I'm using. I think I'm using red. That means the IPT hasn't hit. Yeah, I remember the other day I had like, that looks pretty good too. I've been watching that one a little bit. It looks like it can be a little thin at times. But you can see you want to buy something that it looks like that, not that, because that's down towards the lows. Not that. Something that's making some new highs and looking pretty good. And also, and I'll pay for your webinar tonight, don't buy anything that's below the 30 EMA. All right, any, any questions on Bitcoin? We're getting ready to shift gears. We'll take a look at the market and then we'll start looking at some, um, we'll look at your individual stocks. Okay, Brian, we'll take a look at that in one second. Intel, CPNG, we'll take a look at that too. Sure, keep them coming. All right, let me get the, let me get this up and running. Any other questions on crypto? All right, let me get the screen shared. And we'll jump over to stocks. Where did it go? All right, y'all bear with me one second. I lost my thing. Oh, here it is. So a comedian talking about people on Zoom calls. Let me get my screen shared. All right, SP 500, decent day today, obviously. Um, yesterday was all over the place. That that might be some concern when you when you have a day like today, as uh, somebody was pointing out in YouTube. Let me see who was talking about that. Who was talking about that? That was. Hope it might have got deleted. But yeah, that 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 could be something when that volatility increases like that. I ha I haven't fleshed it out. I've been trying to look at HV and some other things, but you might be on to something when the volatility of the market begins to kind of get a little crazy. That could be signs of a top because it's like the the, the early shorts are getting squeezed out, and then the the late longs are jumping in, and then those those early shorts are like, aha, I've come back in again, and Everybody's kind of fighting it out. But we did have a little bit of a bounce today in the peas. I wouldn't start kissing each other just yet. As I've been saying quite a bit, we are at a bit at an inflection point. Longer term, take a look at like a weekly. We still look okay. We're just kind of pulling back in here. But do pay attention to those zones we talked so much about earlier. But you can see any additional weakness here would make this market look pretty ugly because you'd have the bow tie, you've got the Landry light below the 50 simple moving average. We got thwarted at the 50 simple moving average. So we're definitely at an inflection point. And, and somebody had put out a survey in the Facebook group. It's like bullish bearish. It's like, you know, uh, could you put inflection point in there? Uh, I'm certainly not not super bullish, and I'm probably a little bit on the bearish side right now. But if we have a couple of big up days, I'm willing to change my tune. NASDAQ composite, same sort of action as the P's. You're getting a little overhead supply in these indices. 
bow tie downtrend profit water. When that happens after all time highs, it usually pays to pay attention. It doesn't mean it's the end of the world. It means you need to think about what's going on. You need to pay attention. <laughs> My wife watches these shows where they talk like that the entire time. We're going to put a ladder in the corner of the house and some potted plants to make your eye attracted to the corner. It's like, oh, God, shut up. <laughs> anyway, I think I just did that. Uh, Russell, same as it ever was, same as it ever was, right? Uh, bow tie to the downside, little David Byrne reference there. <laughs> By the way, they did a um, once in a lifetime with uh they use trump and i don't know whether it's for trump or against trump but it's it's awesome <laughs> if you get a chance watch uh once in a lifetime after this video of course uh with uh talking heads so russell yeah russell's just just a mess it's a hot mess it's been a hot mess forever M mountains and mountains overhead supply i don't know what's wrong with this guy it had a decent day today but it it, it just looks toppy and choppy so I would avoid that. Uh, Bitcoin, we just talked about. Gold, the commodity looking okay in here. So far, just pulling back. I'm not too nervous about this gap in here because it is a commodity. Looks pretty good so far, at least. Gold, the stocks are looking okay. Looks like they're trying to get out of a pullback. I haven't really found a lot of setups here. I've had a, we have a silver stock we've been trying to get long for weeks, but it hasn't triggered. It'll probably come off the service soon, and I'll tell you what it is. But um, we'll just have to wait and see what happens there. Now, in a bit of a, the bummer department, we have energies, which were the other commodity that was doing well. They're now beginning to break down a little bit. You can see that the XLE is down towards the 50, was below it yesterday. Take a look at OIH. This guy has just rolled right back over. So that's a bit of a bummer. Um, I was a little bummed out because I wasn't finding any energy stocks to get excited about, even though the, the energy stocks were headed higher. And then now I know because they're rolling back over. Maybe maybe that was the database trying to tell me that they're not as great as the, the overall index looks. Transports have recently rolled over, a little bit of a bounce today. That looks questionable at best, kind of a rounded top inverted cup whatever you want to call that software has been rolling over in here for quite some time the semis are a bit of a bummer because they got thwarted at their 50 simple moving average they're still in downtrend proper order yeah a few big updates would be all it would take to push into this overhead supply and it would look a lot better but for now it looks questionable at best retails none of those areas recently rolled over in here Look at a little dubious. Major drugs have bounced back to that 50, but they're looking kind of questionable in here. I had a client years ago. Um, he's one of those clients that kind of comes and goes. <laughs> he comes for a few years, he goes away, he comes back. But uh, he was a huge fan of the 50 simple moving average, and he would always play uh, bounces off of the 50, you know, and, and maybe he's on to something because a lot of these areas are, are hitting resistance right at that 50, and it might be. A little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. There's still the commodity. Still looks okay so far. Just a kind of a deep pullback there. I think that's pretty much it as far as the market is concerned. Uh, home builders, we're short KBH, which has not worked out yet. But you know the old adage, all shorts go against you. So if you need something short, uh, just put all your kids' college funds into this one, okay? That was a joke. <laughs> Sometimes I'll say college friend worthy when I really like a stock, but uh, please don't do that. <laughs> it, I, it, it probably wouldn't hold up in court. It's like, let me get this right. This guy is a self-proclaimed trend following moron and you did what he said, even though he was joking. All right, let's take a look at some of these stocks you guys are talking about. CPNG from my brother from another mother, John Z. Good to see you, John, CPNG. Yeah, that's looking pretty good. Um, it's got some longer term overhead supply, but that is a ways back. It's got tons and tons of volume. Look at that, 14 million on average. Yeah, it needs a little bit deeper pullback, 
but yeah, on a deeper pullback, I think it'd be okay. I'm a little nervous about the longer term overhead supply. I guess that'd be a good problem to have, but it's going to have a hard time getting through the the mid 20s here. So I'd pass just based on that and some of its wide and loose action. But I hear you. It looks it's decent looking for sure. Trading the indices if you are bored. SQQQ, SP, XS, etc. Yeah, I uh, occasionally will short the SQQQ. It makes it makes for a good long, uh, so to speak, for the overall market. Um, all of these inverse ETFs, by the way, will eventually go to zero, as you may know. Let's take a look at a monthly SQQQ. Yeah, so it was a used to be a half a million dollars a share. Okay, obviously that's not split adjusted, but. Uh, or it is split adjusted. How's that work? Yeah, it's split adjusted. And you know, the problem, the problem is you, you know, you're like, oh, I'm gonna just get long SQQQ. We have a bear market or whatever. Well, they'll reverse split you to death in these things, believe me. You know, you're like, okay, just you could just hang on forever. Well, they'll they'll kill you. Trust me on that one. And then they they're they're doing a day over day or a a price change or, or intraday price change. I'm trying to think how it works. You have to read the prospectus, prospectus on these things, but it doesn't add up. The math doesn't add up. And then let's say you have a, a market that sells off real hard, then they have the short profits and they have to pile in more short profits. So it ends up being kind of a reverse martingale type of thing where, where they eventually all go to zero. So don't hold these things I don't like holding them uh, other than intraday. I, I I never take them home. I'm saying if you're bored, look at ETFs. Okay, um, MLI. Yeah, this one's okay. You know, my only issue here is this. Um, it's just one big bar here before this little pullback. And yeah, it's been in a longer term trend. I prefer if this was like a few bars. But it's 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 decent, okay. HV is a little low at 29. Um, again, I just kind of hate when there's just one bar in this breakout. I'd prefer if it's like two or three bars higher, or more than two or three bars higher before pulling back. But I definitely give it an okay. I can't really pick it apart too much, uh, Jeff. I love you, brother. Jumped in ABT with you. Oh, ABT. Oh, ABT. The, yeah, I just bought that. I see, I already forgotten about it. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, it's two of us. Let's see what happens. Okay. So you're doing the indices versus uh, individual stocks right now. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing I've been looking at a little bit is um, some of these bigger cap stocks and trying to catch them on an intraday basis, kind of like a Russian doll type of stocks. Uh, strategy. So, like, pay attention to the um, the Landry list. You know, some of those big cap stocks on there. Okay, Intel. Yeah, Intel. It's not looking so hot, uh, Brian. Uh, draw your big blue arrows there. You can see it's um, it's definitely in a downtrend. So that's uh, that's kind of ugly. I haven't seen this one in a while. It hasn't come up in my scans, but yeah, that's a that's an ugly stock. Let's take a look at um, big boy like Nvidia. Yeah, see, Nvidia is starting to look toppy in here too, and it's kind of running up here and kind of skirting along that 50. So that looks kind of scary. One year low with contraction. Yeah, see, that's the thing too. That's you know, it's a one year low, but you don't want to. You don't want to trade not to lose. Like, oh, I'll just get an Intel down here, bottom fish at 30, and I'll stop out at 29.75. And that might be the final low. Who knows, right? But chances are two things are going to happen. One, you're probably going to end up risking more than 25 cents, especially if you're date, if you're if you're position trading, and you come in tomorrow and look at that last gap, like five or six points. You could have a five or six point gap against you. And if you put a little size on, you're gonna be a hurt and pop really fast. So I would leave that alone. It's low on the scooter. I don't use scooter, but um, I'm sure it has some merit. 
it seems to have a great fundamental story. Now that's passed a foundry problem right down. Yeah, I don't, you know, that's, see, that's where years ago I tried to figure it all out. And that's where you're kind of confusing the issue with facts. It's like, well, it's a good value play because they wrote up the foundry problem, whatever that is, uh, the situation in Nigeria or whatever. I guess I didn't say that right. The situation in Nigeria. So, um, but yeah, I would leave it alone as long as the big blue arrow is pointing down. You know, look at what it did back here. Like, let it make a big two-year bottom or whatever that is, one-year bottom. And then look to play a bow tie off of that or something as opposed to catch that falling knife. I just think it's a it's a bad idea. All right, any more? Let me check in with my YouTube brethren and see. You guys okay over here? Yeah, good to see you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, any more? Going once, going twice. Looks like we set a new record for lately at least. So I wanna thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. Any questions? David, Dave, Landry .com. Everybody have a great weekend. I think most everybody here tonight's in Facebook, so I'll see you guys and girls tomorrow. Again, everyone else have a great weekend, and may the trend be with you.